Support for Arkansas Week provided by the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, the Arkansas Times, and KUAR FM 89. And hello again, everyone. Thanks very much for joining us. April tornadoes devastated parts of central Arkansas and all but destroyed a small East Arkansas city. Recovery was never expected to be easy, but need it be as difficult as it has been for so many of us? That's later in this edition. First, an economic issue on a different scale. Arkansas, yes, but national, in fact, global. Once again, it's the U.S. government's debt ceiling and the impending deadline for raising it or not. The consensus, largely bipartisan, is that a federal default would be little short of catastrophic. The House Republican majority is demanding spending cuts in exchange for the debt ceiling, while the White House insists on a straight up or down vote and then budget talks. We're joined now by Congressman Steve Womack. A Republican of Arkansas's 3rd District, he's chair of the Appropriations Subcommittee on Financial Services and Government. Congressman, thanks very much for coming in and, and being with us. Uh, Steve, always uh, good to be with you. Well, Secretary Yellen is saying is perhaps as early as June 1. Uh, you're at loggerheads now. Who's going to blink? Well, it's, a, as I said yesterday to a group of media here in D.C., this is a kind of a dangerous game of chicken that we're playing right now. And let's just put the facts on the table. Yes, we are nearing the uh, D-Day, if you will, for this entire debt ceiling issue around the first part of June. So we've got about three weeks before we have to do something, which I think in congressional terms is quite a long time to ponder something because we just wait to the last minute to do everything. I, I don't like that, but it's just kind of the way things are. But we've known since the first of the year when we hit the actual debt ceiling that we needed to hammer out some kind of agreement. And what House Republicans have said is very simply that we can't keep digging this hole deeper and deeper. And that I think there is pretty much consensus that we need to lift the debt ceiling so we can continue to fund the government and all of the programs associated with the government. But if we're going to do that, then we need something in exchange that helps us uh, move toward a better fiscal trajectory. And so we passed our bill two weeks ago that basically says we'll lift the debt ceiling for a date certain uh, or a certain amount, whichever comes first. But we're going to demand that in order not to be having to do this year over year over year, that we start the process of trimming the size and scope of government and then doing things that we think are smart policy matters that have had bipartisan support in the past, like work requirements for people that are able-bodied without dependents that are getting government benefits, whether it's food stamps or TANF and those sorts of things. We also believe that clawing back the money that uh, was passed by the uh, former Congress on the expansion of the Internal Revenue Service, uh, that, that we think that capping spending in the FY24 level back to pre, not pre-pandemic, but uh, at least pre-2023 levels, that is the 22 uh, budget levels, we, we think that is in order. That's about $130 billion worth of cuts, if you will, to what we're currently spending on the discretionary side. But five months ago, we were operating at those levels. So not a lot has changed since then, maybe some inflation. So we, we just think that some common sense uh, ideas uh, advanced by House Republicans is something that the president and Senator Schumer and Senate Democrats need to take a look at well, the and come to the table with us and let's talk about this well, before we just do a clean debt ceiling. Well, the administration says it's open to a deal and open to discussing uh, spending cuts, but that it, it's irresponsible to tie that to the debt ceiling bill. The, that they ought to but be the problem with that, Steve, is simply this. Th those discussions never happen. So if you get a clean debt ceiling, then there's no leverage anymore. We simply believe that if we're going to raise the debt ceiling, that let's at least have some agreement in this process that we're going to do something, not just talk, because we know what talk has what has accomplished in the past. It has accomplished very little. We're $32 trillion, almost $32 trillion in debt. 
we're, we project a deficit. Well, the deficit last year was about a trillion four. And we will add more to the credit card this year. And even the even the cuts, even the, the, the ideas that we've advanced in our bill that lifts the debt ceiling doesn't begin. I, I mean, it's a it's a good start, but it's not going to fundamentally change the outcomes. We're going to be back here doing this again next year. We just want some assurance that that, that our friends on the left recognize that it's not a revenue problem facing our country right now. It's purely a spending problem. Mm -hmm. And that's why we've advanced the bill that we've advanced. Correct me if I'm wrong, Congressman, but I believe in last October's debates, you indicated that you believed default ought to be on on the table. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe no, no, that. No, 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 no. Go ahead then. I, 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 I don't think defaulting should ever be on the table. And both sides need to kind of put their big boy pants on and recognize that defaulting on the full faith and credit of this country is not a good outcome. And it has global ramifications. And particularly in a day and time when we've got national security implications, I just don't think that this is a wise course of action for us to be flirting with defaulting on on on, on our full faith and credit. You but have, but I said, uh, but, but I believe in my heart that this is not a, a, a case of take our bill or take a clean debt ceiling and nothing in between. This is why you negotiate. And this is why the president should have been at the table over the last hundred days or so in working with Kevin McCarthy, the House Speaker, and trying to forge some kind of agreement because I think there would be bipartisan agreement on some of the measures that we've advanced in the bill that we have offered. To what extent, Congressman, uh, do in the internal politics of the Republican conference in the House enter into this? Uh, the speaker has a very narrow majority on, on his side, and some of your members are demanding, well, they, they're pretty adamant in what they, what they expect, what they demand of the speaker. How does that come into play? How, how big a factor is that? You know, it, it can be a factor if, in fact, you're asking House Republicans to carry this entire uh, issue by itself, then obviously what the speaker has to do is he has to appease uh, the, you know, the extreme part of our party. Uh, because when you've got a, a four or three seat majority, as we do right now, Steve, I mean, it doesn't take, you know, a, a master's degree in math or logic to figure out that you've got to if you've got to do things on your own, you're going to have to, every one of those people have a, a significant input into the, into the outcome. So even the more, you know, the moderate part of our conference uh, has as equal representation as a House Freedom Caucus on the, uh, on the extreme part of our caucus. Uh, but what I'm advocating is I'm advocating bipartisan solutions to an American problem. This is not just a Republican problem or a challenge. It's not just a Democrat problem or challenge. This is an American problem. And we need to come together as Americans and fix it, which means Republicans are probably not going to get everything that they want that we have already passed in our legislation. But it's and, and we'll have to carry it on our own if, in fact, we're up against nothing more than a clean debt ceiling. But I think there are Democrats that also believe that we are spending uh, at an excessive amount and that there are some reasonable changes that could be uh, advanced in the bill that could get bipartisan support and leave the people that are my way or the highway type politicians, you know, kind of out there uh, separated from the outcome. So we're, we're up against. Yeah, we're up against the clock, Congressman. <laughs> I wish we had more time. Come back soon, if you will. We'll continue to watch. We'd love to, Steve. Thank you so much. Thank A very you, important sir. discussion. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be right back with more. And we are back now with more on the debt ceiling issue. If it seems a bit abstract, more than a little remote, well, let's bring it home to Arkansas, or try anyway. Dr. Jeremy Horpardall joins us from the economics faculty at the University of Central Arkansas. Jeremy, as always, thanks for, for joining us. Thanks for coming back. Thanks for inviting me, Steve. Uh, catastrophic, <coughs> uh, Armageddon. I mean, the words, uh, the adjectives just fly. Adver adjectives, adverbs, everything. <laughs> <laughs> Components of speak, pronouns. What 
What are we about to see here? What are the stakes? Yeah, I think another word we might use is unprecedented or unknown. Oh, yes. uh, this is not something we've gone through before. People might, might remember government shutdowns over not passing a budget. Well, this is something totally different. This is the Congress has already passed a budget. Now we're running into a problem where the Treasury may not be able to actually pay for the things that Congress has authorized uh, because we've hit the debt ceiling. Um, and we don't know what will happen. Treasury, the Treasury Department has said they, they don't really have a way of kind of prioritizing the spending. Uh, so we don't actually know what would happen if, if we were to get to the point uh, which could come in a few weeks when, when they can no longer make payments. Yeah. Basically, what we've done is use a credit card, and now the debate is over whether we pay the bill. <laughs> There's that. There's also, you know, you can think of it uh, about asking your credit card company for an increase in your limit. That's, that's what they're asking well, yeah. for now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, yeah, so they, you know, one of the things that they spend money on, of course, is servicing old debt. Uh, but it, this, this covers everything that the federal government spends money on. The Treasury is the, the agency that spends the money for Congress. And so this would, be, this would affect not just interest payments, but, but all payments the federal government makes. Yeah. How are, in the event of a default, unprecedented, how are we likely to see it? I feel it. Man on the street in Arkansas. Yeah. So whether it's a default or if Treasury chooses to prioritize debt spending so we don't default. Right. Uh, I think that what this will, would still mean is impacts for everyone on the street. We're going to see interest rates would go up, certainly for, for federal debt, which would then affect all other interest rates. And we know for buying a home, interest rates are already much higher than they've been in decades. Uh, we could see those go up. Uh, if they're not making payments to people that either work for the federal government or people that receive payments, uh, those people are going to have less money to spend. That's going to have effects on the broader economy as there's just less spending happening, which could push us closer or into a recession. Yeah, government finance, state, local government. What's what could be even even the threat of default makes makes investors nervous. Makes the world markets nervous. Yeah, the threat of default makes both you know bond and stock markets nervous. I think we're kind of in we've been getting some recovery from what happened in the stock market last year, but that's kind of been, been a holding pattern lately. Uh, as we kind of wait to see what happens here. Um, and I think there's always worry about any fiscal problems, but especially when we don't know exactly how it'll play out. I think that that's really spooks markets as well. Yeah. Economic development, this cannot be helpful. <laughs> no, it, it is not helpful for economic development, for economic growth. Uh, you mentioned state and local governments. State yeah. and local governments depend more and more these days for a lot of their revenue coming from the federal government, whether it's for specific things like health care or building roads or just general support. Uh, this can filter through to all levels of government as well as to, over to the private sector. Yeah. And we have a great many Arkansans, great many Arkansans who depend not only on Medicaid, but as you mentioned, the federal highway funds, financing, Social Security, other. Yeah. Social Security is, is the biggest thing that on a monthly basis the, the Treasury Department is paying out. Uh, but the other health care programs, both Medicare and Medicaid, we have a large number of people in this state, a larger number than most other states on things like Medicaid, sure. um, farm subsidies, things like that. Uh, all these payments would be either stopped or, or cut by some, maybe cut to 80 percent is what they might have to do of what they are currently. Yeah, and, and also we have, uh, no matter what, you, but, well, assuming that you are putting away some money anyway in some sort of investment instrument or are you receiving money from you're already retired and you're taking funds from uh, from uh, an investment account a retirement account you're a little wary you're a little nervous yeah i mean i guess if we want to see a silver lining it's that maybe they'll get cheap we can buy more stocks but i think that's that's <laughs> we don't want that temporary cheapness we want we want those markets to keep going up both for people saving right. uh, and people currently retired um you know with the stock market in the past year still down a little bit uh, you know, that's that's been one of the not good parts of the economy, even though the labor market, things like that have been strong. Well, give us an economist guess, because Mr. Womack said, uh, characterized as many people have, is a game of chicken that we pay about, play about every so often. It's been about a dozen years now, executive, legislative. Who's going to blink? <laughs> Boy, I mean, it's hard to say, but I think the, the, the White House has said they do not, they're, that default is not even an option, right? right? And I think everyone agrees on that, but I think that means that uh, when, it, when push comes to shove, they're gonna have to agree to something. Uh, but you know, that's more for, for the congressman probably knows better than me what's, what's happening in, in that area. But I think these games of chicken are not, not helpful to anyone. I think yeah. that, and, and most economists think that 
the, the debt ceiling doesn't really reduce our long-term debt. It's, there may be other policies which would do that, but this one is just kind of, just kind of in the way. And, Taxes uh, and, and spending. That's <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Jeremy Horpital, thanks very much for coming in. As always, come back soon. Thank you, Steve. And we'll be back in a moment. Back now, there were lives lost. And no putting a dollar figure on that. And the deaths were, to be certain, the worst of it. Apart from that, still, the spring tornadoes that raked across central Arkansas and nearly erased the cross-county seat of wind caused damage in the hundreds of millions of dollars, perhaps even more, when all the bills are totaled. For many Arkansans with residential or commercial losses, the recovery process is proving almost as traumatic as the tornadoes. Why? Well, we're joined now by Mayor Jennifer Hobbs of Wynn and by Kelly Erstein. He's the CEO and Executive Director of the Independent Insurance Agents of Arkansas. We thank both of you for coming in. Mayor, let me begin with you, uh, if we may. Uh, your community absolutely, well, to say that it was hard hit is understated uh, the situation. How is your recovery proceeding? You know, I've not ever been through it, but from what I understand, we're we're moving along as well as could be expected. Um, we are still trying. To, we're in the cleanup stage. We're trying to get every all the debris removed so that people can start rebuilding their homes and uh, moving forward. This, you are encountering some snags because there always are in emergency situations such as this. What what are the uh, what are the snags that you're experiencing? Well, we we had so many homes damaged. We still have homeowners that don't have a definite answer from their insurance companies whether their home is going to be able to be repaired or they're going to have to demolish it and start all over. Um, we are still trying to get um, those homes that we know are not going to be salvageable demolished and moved to the road. We're still waiting on FEMA to um, help us with our housing. They have agreed to take on a direct housing mission um, for Cross County. Um, but they have not been able to make a decision on where they're going to locate that yet. So um, it's a slow process. In, in terms of commercial property and commercial losses, in terms of the economy of Cross County and when, uh, are you seeing some progress in that front in terms of recovery? We actually are. Um, we were very pleased to see how many businesses could, could relocate. We've had... Um, Business partners open up their doors and make room for, for additional personnel in their buildings. Um, we're actually seeing uh, the Domino's Pizzas already started reconstruction, um, and that's making great progress. Um, we still have some that have not made a decision on what they're going to do and where they're going to relocate, but um, we, we were pleased to see how many could already be back up working, and that's great for our city. Uh, Kelly Erstein of the insurance industry. Uh, this is a difficult time for the industry. Uh, a lot of work to be done. And there is some always is some disappointment on the part of property owners, homeowners or commercial owners. Give us your update, your assessment now. No doubt about it, Steve. Um, I think the mayor would agree with me. Um, the ramifications, uh, the effects of this storm uh, the EF3, almost an EF4, uh, I think will uh, be felt for months, if not years to come. Uh, when you think about uh, claims that are being made now, will continue to be made. Uh, the restoration of uh, existing uh, property, what's left of that. When you think about displacement, relocation of families. Uh, when you think about opening up businesses, uh, this is a very, very long process that we're embarking upon. There are all uh, there are complaints as always about the shortfalls in compensation by the insurance and the, the very process itself, filing a claim, processing a claim. Uh, is the industry able to cope with it at this point? I think we are, but I would tell you that there are uh, deficiencies as well. Um, uh, were there underinsured uh, uh, dwellings? Yes, no doubt about it. Um, so many times I think that um, many homeowners don't realize 
maybe the possibility of their being underinsured until that claim actually happens and a, and a uh, catastrophe that occurred uh, both in uh, Cross County, Wynn, Pulaski County, uh, the effects of that are not known until uh, the damage is done. Unfortunately, uh, a lot of folks don't understand what is included in their policy. So there is a rude awakening sometimes when, when that is, uh, uh, really comes to, uh, to grips with that insurer. Not every homeowner's policy is a replacement policy. Am I? It is not. There are some that are actual, uh, and, and we, uh, as independent agents, I might add, uh, really uh, suggest that uh, it be a full replacement uh, cost uh, to, the, uh, to the policy but not all are a full replacement cost. Some, as you said, are actual cash uh, values. There is a big, big difference there. Um, and, and then as well, uh, I mean, you don't know those limits um, uh, when you purchase your policy sometimes uh, unless you really have that conversation with your agent. And, and to me, I think today's conversation is about that clearing call, if you will, that uh, insureds need to have that conversation with their agents and it, and it needs to go both ways. At a minimum, it's time for review. N no doubt about it. I mean, if, if there's a sliver of a, a silver lining here, I think it has caused people to really look back, uh, consult with their agents, be their trusted advisor to their policies and look to see if they have adequate coverage. I mean, I live this every day. Uh, I live here in Conway, so I was not affected by the storms, but believe me, I went back and looked at my own policy. And it's, a, it's, it's, it's something that needs to be done annually, if you will, with your, uh, with your insurance advisor. All right, let me go back to the mayor if I can. We have had, even before the storms, Your Honor, we have had problems. Every business, every enterprise of any kind has had difficulties coping with inflation, supply chains, and labor shortages. I have to imagine that's especially acute given your situation there in Cross County and when. It is really of great concern to us because we have so many homes that are gonna to need to be replaced. Um, we are concerned about the supply chain issues. We're concerned about having enough contractors available to do the work in a timely manner, um, provided they can get the items that they need. And so, um, we're not to the stage yet that we know exactly what those effects are going to look like for us, but they are definitely major concerns that we have. This is a situation that's not unusual in, in uh, disasters of this. We don't know what we don't know and won't for some weeks, possibly months. Kelly Erstein. Uh, exactly, Steve. And, you know, the, the laws of insurance, it's, it's, it's spreading the risk, if you will. And not only do these occurrences, uh, not only do uh, rates uh, that, uh, uh, with uh, catastrophes that occurred in Arkansas, uh, rates are really, uh, really affected by overall in the, in the U.S. And, and what happens regionally uh, with losses there. So it, it, it has kind of a, a, a uh, an effect that uh, folks really don't understand the impact until months down the road, as you just said. Inflation of the sort that we are experiencing now is, I'm assuming, an especially aggregating factor in compensation. Uh, no doubt about it, but you can include that as well in your policy. Uh, uh, you can inc include uh, higher limits as far as de uh, debris removal, tree removal, things like that. But when you have those certain types of endorsements, of course it costs the policy, uh, uh, the premium to go up. And so some folks, and I understand this, some folks have to make that decision that maybe they can't have some of those coverages that they really need. All right, Mayor, where are we now? I mean, what's the next step for Win and Cross? The next step is obviously to work with partner with FEMA to get the direct housing in here. Um, we are starting to put together our long-term recovery team. We, we want to see what the options are out there that we can do to assist um, homeowners with moving forward as well as just our community in general moving forward. We, we have to rebuild a high school. We have to rebuild a wastewater treatment facility and um, as well as assist our, our citizens with getting their lives back together. You, you mentioned uh, FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Are you satisfied with the response from the feds thus far? Yes, sir. They've been very good to work with. Um, of course, 
they they don't move in the timely manner that um, I would like to see, but that we're moving a whole government. So it, it's not the same as our small town. Um, we don't get the reaction as quickly as we're used to, but that they have been a very nice and knowledgeable to work with. Well, we're going to have to end it there because we're simply out of time. Mayor Hobbs, Kelly Erstein, the insurance agencies, <clears throat> insurance agents, thanks very much to you for coming in. Thank you. Mayor, thank you for giving us your time as well. And that does it for us for this week. As always, we thank you for watching, and we'll see you next week. Support for Arkansas Week provided by the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, the Arkansas Times, and KUAR FM 89.